We're doing, it. We're doing an invention. It's priority. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. Live life as though everything is though everything is rigged in your favor. Ignore the noise. Have faith in yourself. Have faith in yourself. Recognize that you are an entrepreneur. From the campus of the University of Maryland's Robert H. Smith School of Business, the Dingman Center for Entrepreneurship presents Bootstrap. <laughs> Welcome to the fifth season of Bootstrapped, a Dingman Center podcast. I'm Ilana Fine. And I'm Joe Bailey. And as our loyal listeners know, each episode of Bootstrapped features a funder or founder from the Dingman Center and University of Maryland community. Today we welcome Sonny Bajaj. Sonny is the CEO and founder of DMI and a member of the Smith School Advisory Board. Welcome, Sonny. Thank you. It's good to be here. So before we dig in into your own entrepreneurial endeavors, I thought we could talk a little bit about your family and your family's, uh, how entrepreneurship has really run through your family and your connection to the Dingman Center. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I had the good fortune of having two entrepreneurial parents. Uh, so entrepreneurship was a little bit of a visceral thing for me. You could say it was in my blood. And uh, growing up, uh, we didn't really have a babysitter. So the office was the babysitter. So I would run around in office environment at a young age. And, uh, you know, it was like being a sponge. You pick up a lot. And uh, it, was, it was great. Both mom and dad separately, you know, independently have been entrepreneurs. What, what kind of businesses did they start? Uh, mostly in the technology space. Uh, mom had a company in the mid-'80s, early-'90s in uh, networking. And, uh, and then dad had a, a business internet company in the dot-com era. And so were you employee number single digits, perhaps, with those companies? I wouldn't call it employee, <laughs> maybe intern, <laughs> right. you know, summer intern. Uh, but everything from the mailroom to the copy center to fixing PCs, uh, that was a neat experience. So what are some of those things that you saw your parents doing and, and you kind of seeing that and living that visceral experience? What do, you, what do you bring with you today? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of it was just being around. Uh, it's almost if you're a coach's kid on the sideline. You know, you kind of learn to watch some of the plays develop and some of the, the players and personalities. So... At a young age, listening to terms like um, RFP, you know, and, and things like that, you know, uh, you kind of don't realize it, but you're picking up a lot of business acumen and terms at the time. So it was, it was an interesting experience. Uh, RFP the time, is request for proposals? That's correct, or, yeah. Okay, yeah. shoot, I thought I was going to be kicked off in the first few <laughs> minutes of the episode, but I'm glad. Okay. So our executive producer, Oscar, comes from a family of doctors, and he decided to do the total opposite and launch Podcast Village. <laughs> so, uh, but you kind of, you followed, you followed the trend. Did you, did you, did you always see yourself as an entrepreneur, or did it just kind of naturally happen? Uh, it just kind of naturally happened. Um, you know, obviously growing up, you're not quite sure what you want to do for a living. Uh, and then I was sitting there one day with my father after I graduated college, uh, and uh, he's like, kid, what do you want to do for a living? I want to be an entrepreneur like you and mom. And, you know, he's like, well, just do it. You know, don't think about it. You have an idea, go run with it. And I was like, well, I'm 25 years old. <laughs> and I'm a little too young. I don't really know what I'm doing. And uh, he's like, it doesn't matter. That's the, that's the great part about entrepreneurship. And, and obviously the, the opportunities in this country is, you know, you can have an idea and run with it. And the sky's the limit. So, no, I didn't really have it figured out. It kind of just happened. And so you had said while we were prepping for the show that you were thinking about going back to get your MBA and you decided to instead, I think you referred to it as MBA by fire. Uh, on steroids. On steroids, <laughs> sorry. Right. Uh, so to talk a little bit about that decision to you know, start a company versus. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So, you know, I graduated undergrad. I was working for my father's e-business firm at the time. Um, six months after I joined, he sold it. Uh, I stayed with the firm for another few years to learn. And I was going to go back and do my MBA. So I took my GMAT, so I applied for schools. And, um, you know, once again, I was sitting with my father, and he said, kid, I'm all about education. I have a PhD, you know, so I'm happy that you want to pursue higher education. But what are you going to do with your MBA? You know, you're going to be sitting here in a year or two years from now with an MBA, and what do you want to do? So Dad sold his company, so you yeah, can't. Well, exactly. I mean, yeah, by the way, you were out. there only six months, so I'm not sure yeah. if you vested fully by that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My stock option package. Was <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, he said, uh, look, you know, start a company. It's an MBA on steroids. You know, worst case, you fail, but you learned a lot. You know, and it's better to do that than, than you know, waste time in business school because you're going to end up back in the same, you know, square one of sitting here trying to figure out, now what do I do for a living even though I have an MBA, but still, what do I want to do, you know? 
you, you knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur, but how did you get that, that kind of starting point of an idea about what type of startup you would be creating? Yeah, so that's a that's actually a really good question. Um, so the way it kind of came to me was, you know, I grew up in in e business, and I interned at Goldman Sachs, so I had a little bit of finance background, and I majored in economics at Maryland. And September 11th happened, and I was watching the news, and you know they're talking about how the FBI wasn't sharing information with you know uh, the CIA and NSA and. I'm saying to myself as a technologist, well, technology can fix that problem. Why is it that we have all these disparate systems that don't talk to each other and connect? And so that was really the kind of impetus behind starting the company is uh, start with the federal government arena, since they're right here in the backyard in the D.C. area, and help them modernize their systems so that they can be more interoperable and talk and, uh, you know, help them and help us, right, as society be more efficient. So that was really the uh, Yeah, and if I may pick up on that point, this idea of interoperability among IT systems is really a huge win. I know in the past we've talked about network effects and the value of kind of sharing information and growing the size of the network. And when you get this interoperability over these previously stovepipe systems, that you can kind of get those wins. And I think that 9-11 kind of, uh, you know, seminal point in our, our kind of collective history showed how non-interoperable a lot of these IT systems were. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And obviously, being in technology, I know that the technology is there. You know, it's a question of now just helping a customer, you know, uh, implement and achieve it. So, so that was kind of the first phase was the interoperability, and then we kind of moved up to the whole digital stream nowadays, and that's kind of where we've been focusing most of our time. So it was interesting when I was looking at noticing that the company was started, I think, in 2002, mm -hmm. which is an interesting time because I was thinking about it as post dot com bubble burst. You don't that was a, there weren't that many technology companies started in that time. But now it makes a lot of sense. And it was kind of an answer to, you know, 9-11, which you know, happened around the same time. Yeah, no, interesting it was interesting in your timeline. It was just taking advantage of uh, after September 11th. It's no secret. We started to spend a lot of money. You know, the government, right, modernizing systems, the, the, you know, terrorism effort, you know, combating that and all that. And so it was kind of a right place at the right time of being able to, to, to you know, help that market sector out. And, and were you always kind of focused then on federal and enterprise as opposed to, let's say, B2C, which is, I think, more affected by the dot-com? Yeah, absolutely. So our kind of model was more federal uh, and enterprise. And, and so, you know, predominantly started – with the federal government, and then about seven years ago, six years ago, we've we've kind of pivoted a little and uh, expanded to the commercial arena. So a lot of yeah. So we want to get to that pivot point. I think that our audience is going to enjoy that. But but tell us about kind of some of your first customers and kind of because you know saying that I'm going to sell kind of complex interoperability solutions to the federal government as a startup. I think most yeah. federal contractors say you know get out of my office. You know we <laughs> we give big contracts to you know big established yeah. companies. How do, how do you win that business? Yeah, no, so that's a great question. So, you know, of course, you know, you're an entrepreneur and you're 25 and you're just excited to, you know, uh, be doing something. So, you know, I realized that I'm not going to walk into a client and walk out with a $10 million contract of the most trusted IT assets, you know. Um, so I kind of took a few steps back and said, okay, well, what's the path of least resistance to enter that marketplace? And, uh, you know, I realized that it was, you know, lack of a better word, staffing. You know, mm -hmm. placing uh, individuals on on projects and subcontracts, and that way you gain your past performance. Uh, you know, your employee base, your revenue, and uh, especially in the federal world, uh, in, in the in the Beltway banded arena, one of the things they judge you on is your size, right? So the bigger you are, it, the perception is you do good quality work because you wouldn't have gotten that big. Uh, so you just kind of get yourself bulked up over time, you know, to the point where they can start to take on the prime contracts, you know, and then build your own direct relationship with clients. And so was that the value proposition at the time that you understood that the big companies needed to be staffed well so that they could grow and show that they could, you know, staff whatever new work that they were proposing. So you were, you know, helping them essentially look bigger to yeah, get the contracts. Basically, or you know, yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, uh, let us help you fill some of your holes or positions, right? And it's a win-win for both of us. You know, I get to slowly build my company. You get to provide the service to the end client. Uh, and so that's really kind of the way, you know, it started. Uh, and then, of course, from there, it started to evolve. Yeah, but, you know, people who are familiar with the space realize the margins aren't all that mm -hmm. healthy. So, you know, yes, you have the revenue, but you also have kind of costs that are tracking with revenue. So right. while you're you're growing and getting bigger and kind of establishing yourself, how do you go ahead and think about financing such an operation when maybe the margins are not as healthy as other lines of business? 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the things that we did was uh, put in place a line of credit, you know, um, probably around the six month point, maybe 12 month point of business. Luckily, you know, through the friends and family network, I was able to leverage that, you know, the, the bank of mom and dad, so to say. <laughs> so, you know, unlike a traditional entrepreneur that really yeah. had to bootstrap, bootstrap, you know, my bootstrapping <laughs> was a little bit different. But I, I've got to imagine, like, your mom and dad as seasoned entrepreneurs, they were pretty getting, getting some good terms with, with a lot of credit <laughs> they're giving you as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's just say that, uh, you know, they were, they had a, they had a added benefit, not just watching me be successful, yeah. but, uh, you know, uh, you know, I promised our grandkids yeah. one day. So. Yeah, I was gonna say. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna it sounds like blood. your mom's still yeah. waiting for that. <laughs> now, um, okay, so you know, fast forward a little bit. Uh-huh. You're getting to know all the big contractors through by helping them with staffing. You know, how did you reach the next the next milestone, or what did you see as the next milestone? Yeah, so um, after about my first, maybe second year of business, uh, I was in a situation where. I was able to uh, market to some federal agencies and have them spend end of year money directly with me. Uh, so my first two federal clients on a, on a direct basis were the Small Business Administration and National Institutes of Health. And they both had end of year dollars and they said, okay, you know, kid, we'll give you a shot, you know, to come in and do some work for us. And so that was kind of our big break into, I mean, there were small contracts, about $40,000 each. but. You know, that was our, okay. But for those who don't understand the environment, if you don't spend that money at the end of the year, you don't, you don't like get it the it, next time, it right? It, so yeah. they have, that was an interesting way to exactly. get Exactly, so kind of the, the right place yeah. at the right time, yeah. you know, uh, you know, they kind of let it rain on us a little bit. And yeah. so we used that opportunity to go in and own the contract and provide good work and then build our reputation and kind of grow it from there. And is this kind of the plan all along that you would kind of scale and grow this way or? Um... To be honest with you, I was very ambitious, and I thought that I could boil the ocean, and then I kind of realized, you know, running around in circles that, hey, no one's going to give you an opportunity to boil the ocean. you got to start a little smaller here, yeah. you know, and kind of chunk it up. So that You were 25, right? right? Yeah. So you can conquer the world. Yeah, yeah so, um, but the real goal was, you know, as a small company, you're a lot more in tune with customer service and the pace of technology change and, you know, the technology, the bigger company is a little farther removed. They're not as innovative, you know, um, but they have the size and scale to take on the bigger projects. So I kind of knew that if you could fill that gap there of being close to the technology and the innovation, but show that you can take on, you know, projects yourself and start to deliver it, that that's a good niche and market and that you can kind of fly underneath, you know, the bigger guys and then one day start competing with them. So as you're growing, the kind of sweet spot for the size of the project keeps incrementally increasing, I guess, as you have success. And Absolutely, can go after. yeah. Do you ever kind of maybe bite off more than you could chew? One project maybe like, oh, what do we do here? Oh, so you <laughs> never want to let your client down. So, yeah. I mean, there have been instances where, you know, we've uh, you need to staff pretty quickly. Uh, but luckily, it's just that blood, sweat, and tears, you work around the clock and somehow pull a rabbit out of the hat and make it happen. Um, yeah, I remember, uh, you know, we won that 40K work, and then about a year later, you know, um, I won a, a seven $800,000 a year contract. Uh, and so now all of a sudden, it's I was nice like, oh, exactly, right? well, look at this. We're starting to punch up, up above our weight a little bit here, you know. And so, um, you know, for anyone listening who is either already in the in the federal contracting space or thinking about getting into it you know how do you how do you think through or how did you think through who your customer was um in at the various agencies that you were talking to like how did you approach that a uh, sales process yeah that's that's actually a, a really good uh thing to discuss or think about because uh a lot of people especially if you're new uh to federal contracting uh, aren't quite sure who who's the actual buyer right. You know, is it the contracting officer who awards and signs the actual contract? You know, is it the person on the program side, you know, that actually has the budget and the dollars? You know, where do, is it the CIO? You know, where, where do you go? And so it, it varies, you know, agency by agency. Uh, but I really found that, uh, you know, the, the end user, the person with the mission need or program need, you know, uh, whether it's developing new software or managing a network uh, or some consulting support, that's the person to really go to. Uh, because they're the ones that actually, you know, my father used to always tell me, you know, son, 
you know, people rob banks because that's where the money is. You know? <laughs> yeah. So find out who has the money, you know, and the organization and the purse strings, and then go and market to that person. You had to have all the certifications, I imagine, because the federal procurement process isn't it's just as simple as, hey, just write me a check, and I'm happy to provide services. I mean, that you must have brought with you before you started. Yeah, uh, so it was all new to me, the procurement side. Uh, I mean, sure, I knew about, you know, being a small business or, some, you know, woman-owned or service disabled veteran in A-Day and things like that, but... Um, one of the things I did realize was the more contract vehicles you can put in place, uh, then it facilitates their ability to spend with you or they're spending in a limited procurement environment. So you have a higher chance of winning because now you're not competing against the entire world, but maybe a, a smaller subset of firms. So those vehicles actually served us very well and helped us kind of grow pretty rapidly uh, through the years. So um, when you think, I think that everyone who thinks about this space sees it as uh, a pretty busy or I don't know if I'd say crowded because there's so much there's a lot of work to do but there are a lot of players in this space how would you say you you differentiated yourself kind of in the in the you know, the second version of the company when you're moving beyond the, the yeah, staffing yeah. Um, and how did you communicate that to the to the customer the end users so you you know we all start somewhere yeah. you know uh, and then so the staffing was just a means to the get us off the ground right and then from then it was kind of funneling everything we do into what is our niche, right? and, and specifically in my case, you know, DMI was Digital Management Inc. So it was more digital technology. So we tried we tried to stay more towards the higher end, you know, modernization type of activities, interoperability, things like that, rather than the facilities management or the you know the help desk or things like and that. How did you identify who when you talked about the end user and the agencies that you were working with? How did you identify which of those agencies might be the earlier adopters of what kind of, it sounds like what you were saying? We want to be a little more cutting edge. Mm -hmm. How did you identify who was going to be those those top? Yeah, so there's customers. a few different ways. So one, you can see who gets the funding in dollars, right? And then two, you go to a lot of these industry events, whether it's IFCO or IAC or things like that. And then you hear the federal uh, folks speak and you can tell, OK, what's on the agenda, you know, what's important to them. Uh, someone it might be cloud, you know, someone else it might be web services, someone else it might be cyber, uh, and then you can kind of target. And then there's a lot of transparency with federal, so you can actually look to see what kind of recompetes are happening or procurements are upcoming, funding levels, things like that. So um, there's a lot of known work out there that you can go and target for the recompete, uh, and then there's a lot of discretionary funds where if you come up with a good idea and they have a need, you know, they can... Uh, put a procurement out that you can bid on. Uh, That's a really interesting point, and is that sometimes I don't think I'd thought about it if you think about the you know federal space versus the the private sector. In that, a lot of times when we say and we talk to our students about this, is like they say, "Well, how do I know? How do I know that my customer needs this?" And we say, well, go talk to them. But that's a lot of time to go and talk to a lot mm -hmm. of customers and figure out. You're saying, you know what? The federal government kind of gives you the keys to the kingdom in some way because they have to say what they need. And so, and they have to kind of give you a yeah, timeline and a path, which is a lot different than going and saying, okay, what does, you know, what is Google going to buy this year? Very much so. And everything yeah. I said is, you know, is pretty uh, published knowledge, right? So you can go and pick, a, you know, Department of Agriculture. And they'll have their IT strategic plan published online somewhere, and you can read through it and see what their priorities and initiatives are. And, and the incumbent that you're competing against has had to disclose the contract that they won previously, so you'll know kind of what their bid amount was and the nature right. of the service, because that's all part of the kind of disclosure process. Yeah, you know, it really gives you the ability to sharpen your pencil and, mm -hmm. and not just propose a solution that I'm going to do business as usual. Uh, I mean, you could, but, right. but if, if you if you know that, okay, they, they may want a little bit of change or modernization or maybe cost cutting or, you know, a uh, different way to build a better mousetrap, so to say, what have you, you know, it's that opportunity to go and propose that. And in early stages, you're kind of your own salesperson developing these relationships with CIOs and having conversations to figure out what's going on? Yeah. I mean, when you're small, you know, you kind of have to do it all. I was just uh, telling someone earlier today uh, um that uh, up until even about 40, 45 employees, I was still configuring every laptop myself for new hires, <laughs> you know, uh, because obviously you don't have an IT department at that right. size, you know, and so, uh, you know. How big is DMI now? Uh, about 2,500 people. Wow. Yeah. Are you You're still configuring? <laughs> 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 All right, you take the joke, Jim. No, 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 you got it, you got it. You got it. And so that's a good um, a segue, though. Can kind of fa fast fast forward to where you are now. It sounds like you made probably halfway through made a pretty big, or made a pivot towards what your 
product port or service portfolio would be. Yeah. Where so, are. Lana, you know, we were doing and still are very well in the federal uh, marketplace, you know, doing consulting and government contracting. But about six years ago, I realized that it's getting a lot more competitive. The margins are coming down, a lot more protests, which is making things uh, inefficient. And uh, it's just not as, let's just say, sexy as it used to be. And just, just because the protests you're talking about are not people in the streets with pickets. The idea is <laughs> people that are contesting the awarding of a contract Correct. to you as opposed to some Do you have to clarify it's, these dates? It's, yes. the, uh, it's the version of the frivolous lawsuit, basically, in federal right. government where, you know, uh, you win a contract and someone protests it just to, and, and with no recourse and, for, for, for you know, m not much basis, and then that way they can extend the life of their contract mm -hmm. and collect revenue for another few months. You know, so it's a, unfortunately it's a strategy uh, that a lot of companies use in this town, and it makes the process a little efficient, inefficient. And so, okay, so yeah, so you so realized that decided, things needed to change. Uh, let's uh, let's pivot the company um, and let's become more high techy focused. So okay. let's really embrace this new trend of this hyper connected world and mobility, and let's go build a portfolio of end to end mobile enterprise solutions. So basically, digital transformation, but with a mobile first approach. So we went out and organically financed about six acquisitions, uh, a company that does the upfront, you know, kind of digital agency strategy, you know, branding, marketing, you know, consults with a company, a uh, customer, whether government or enterprise, you know, how do you use these new technologies to change your business model, you know, or reach customers better. Uh, a company that built uh, web, uh, sorry, mobile apps and platforms. Uh, we bought an analytics company, which is the data-driven insights, predictive analysis. Uh, we bought a company that does integration of digital commerce systems. More and more people are buying from their tablets and smartphones. At least I know my wife is. <laughs> um, and then a company on the managed services side. So actual physical device management. Right? So if you look at a, uh, a company, they have obviously a desktop or laptop with a standardized software on it. But if you look at the different flavors and sizes of mobile devices, that's challenging if you're, you know, a Fortune 500 company to manage all of your mobile devices for all your employees because most of them have multiple. So uh, we've turned that into a business where they can outsource that. And it sounds like all these acquisitions you have make sense in a constellation that you're trying to promote that full end-to-end -end kind mm -hmm. of enterprise and mobile and stuff like that. But if you're acquiring six, you probably considered 100 times that many or something like that. Tell us about that decision to go inorganic growth and, and the process to find these six? Yeah, so when we talk about building the value proposition, right, so it was, okay, let's be very uniquely positioned and um, strategically figure out how do we, what pieces of the puzzle do we need to build end-to-end -end solutions? So I can go walk up to a client and say, I can do everything from your ideation to developing it to implementing it to managing it for you. And so we thought through, okay, what are the pieces we need? Um, some instances we retained consultants or you know investment banks to find firms. Other instances it was actually as simple as Google searches. And we found companies that way. And then we would reach out to them and say, hey, here's what we're trying to do. Are you interested in being part of this, this model? And so they started as kind of uh, subcontractors, and then eventually you realized there was more something there than just No, the... no, most of them we just right off the bat acquired. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. And then to kind of lower, mitigate the risk at that point, because we organically financed this, we did a lot of uh, these deals structured with earnouts. So as they met, met different financial targets and thresholds, you know, we would in essence, use their own profit to subsidize paying for them. I just ask, is it hard to grow this way? I mean, imagine, you know, you got to imagine that you have employees of the companies of the company that you're acquiring, mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of taking their technology and their, mm -hmm. you know, po policies, procedures, you're ingesting that into your own company. I mean, how hard is that? Yeah, so this is something that uh, a lot of people like to analyze because a lot of acquisitions uh, aren't successful, right? And uh, so at the time when we were doing it, uh, the mindset that I had was, look, let's – make sure that the companies we're looking at uh, have it's almost like a marriage. You want to make sure that there's a good cultural fit, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, you know, we're all kind of unified by common threads. And uh, so all the management teams that were there, you know, I, I had good relationships with, I felt good about them. And from, from a cultural standpoint, you know, they were all kind of young, fun, innovative. Uh, it did add a lot of diversity to us. So now all of a sudden we went overnight from predominantly D.C. metro area and federal government to offices in Barcelona and India and Phnom Penh, Cambodia and Boston and Cincinnati and San Francisco and London. And so it really kind of added this big dynamic. 
Uh, but but there was a lot of good that came with that because now when when we're you know trying to go and compete against some of these larger consulting companies on commercial deals, I can show that I have that scale and size and strength and, and you know, go after those larger programs. Well, this, I mean, did you see this as, because as, as Joe alluded, I mean, this is a pretty risky way to grow, particularly because you were actually growing to enter a whole new space. Mm-hmm. And so did you see this um, as kind of a company risking, like we either are going to, we're either going to, to have very slow growth in the federal space and you know, might even decline, or we kind of have a, to bet the company on a series of acquisitions to go into the commercial space, like, or was it not so black and white? Um, I think the thought process was a little bit more of we have this very good, stable federal business, mm-hmm. you know, that is rock solid, has long term contracts, almost, I don't want to say serves as the cash cow, but, you know, uh, for the most part, it's it's there and it's still growing and it's, and let's use some of the, the margin and profits from that to subsidize this commercial end to end. And if we do it right, we can make that successful, uh, but we kind of have our he- bet hedged a little with the federal stuff. And then we can even take some of those capabilities back to federal and be a first mover, right. you know, in the federal space of offering, you know, mobile apps and strategy. And Which uh, I imagine at that point, the federal government wasn't really a consumer in that uh, for those slightly, solutions, you know, but not, yeah, not the earliest of adopters, not, I'm guessing. No, they weren't the earliest adopters, but just to be one of the first ones out there marketing yourself as being able to provide these services, you know, kind of raised a lot of eyebrows, you know, because we kind of became synonymous with, okay, these guys are pretty innovative and they're leaders. I'd rather do business with them when I'm ready than one of the usual suspects. So, so that was very helpful. So before your first acquisition, what percentage of your revenue was coming from outside the federal space? Um, I would say 1%. 1%. And and where was it after, what what is it today? Uh, It's about 50-50. Is that right? Yeah. It's about 50-50. In the last two years, we made two more acquisitions. Um, we uh, made the decision about two years ago to raise some capital, um, and we raised a lot of eyebrows with what we were doing on the commercial side with this end-to-end mobility uh, capability and solutions. And uh, Goldman Sachs uh, put uh, uh, some money in us for a minority investment. And, that uh, internship years ago paid <laughs> off. And I know, it's, yeah. right? it's like the former Goldman intern <laughs> right, and, comes you know, back, now yeah. is a portfolio company yeah. uh, of theirs. So, yeah, and then we put that money to work, uh, made two more uh, fairly larger size acquisitions. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of where we are right now and just cranking along. It's a lot of fun. So um, in the last couple minutes we have, can you talk to us about how your role uh, as CEO has changed? Can you talk about yourself and it's 25, 26 years old? kind of going out there on your own, had a, a sense that you could conquer the world, you've seen your parents do it, and here you are now, a CEO of a 2,500-person company, you've done eight, eight acquisitions, you know, with teams around the world. What's your day-to-day look like now, other than just being a fantastic bootstrap guest? So there's a lot of traveling, <laughs> I'll tell you that. Uh, no, it's, it's actually very fun because yeah. no, no day is the same. A unique challenge every day, whether it's uh, – you know, an HR-related issue or uh, a new big deal you're trying to go after. So it's a very dynamic day. Uh, it's a lot. It has evolved. Uh, so, you know, initially I'd be obviously a lot more hands-on in sp- project details, things like that. Uh, now it's more strategic. You know, I'm still involved in, in sales calls and, you know, client engagements and employee engagements and things like that. But I think one of the challenges that I was able to uh, navigate through pretty easily that I see a lot of my peers not, and this is, I guess, if I had to give a piece of advice, is, you know, as your business grows, you need to grow with it, right, uh, mentally in terms of uh, the way you look, you know, at, at being a leader and a manager. And a lot of times this mom and pop attitude uh, gets stuck, and, you know, you can't transcend that. And, and you know, as you get bigger, you still want to, micromanage every uh, pencil order, you know, mm-hmm. or, or where we're getting our coffee from or, you know, and the thing is, uh, I've learned if you just hire a good team and you empower your team and you trust them and hold them accountable, you don't have to, and you should not have to worry about all these, the micro decisions, you know, in the organization and, you know, keep growing, you know, and elevate yourself so that as a leader, you know, you can actually look at being a CEO of a larger business and how do I set the strategic direction you know, rather than, oh, I have to be involved in every last second thing because it all revolves around me. And at what point in your journey did you stop calling yourself an entrepreneur? 
Oh, um, probably when you stop configuring laptops. I, very <laughs> early on, very early on, you know, yeah. I, I uh, probably around 50 employees, you know, yeah. and, and even today I don't like to refer to myself as an entrepreneur. Um, I mean, I am, but it's more of, you know, I'm a chief executive officer. But don't yeah. you think there's things about your entrepreneurial mindset, which has allowed you to go ahead and pivot your kind of career in the way you think about your leadership position within DMI? Yeah, I do. I think being young and all that, you're not so set in your ways and you can, you can learn. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and that was, that was very helpful. Um, you know, the other thing is you, you got to really, you know, just learn to grow with the business you know, mentally. You know, and I think that's that's a challenging part for a lot of people. Well, Sonny, I just want to thank thank you and on behalf of you know, Rudy and uh, the <laughs> Dingman Center, uh, thank you and your family for you know, all the support that you've given to the Dingman Center and the Smith School. And um, I think there's a lot that still for our community to learn from you as you now you continue to grow the business and, and be a, a significant leader in the community. So thank you. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Sonny. Well, it's great to have Sonny in studio. Um, the Bajaj name has kind of been, you know, talked a lot around, about at the Dingman Center. So it's always nice to uh, hear a little bit more about his story. Uh, I thought some of the interesting takeaways is that it was interesting to hear how he thought about finding the end user uh, thinking about where we are with our EMBAs right now, where they're trying to, in their course, think through who their target customer is. A lot of times we say, go to the decision maker, go to the economic buyer. But it's interesting to him say, look, like when you know, people rob a bank because they know where the money is, and in the federal government really understanding who is going to be the one saying, this is a must-have solution for me. So I thought that was a really important takeaway. Uh, and, and I love the story about starting in the federal space. And, you know, I would say almost all of our other guests start with an idea and they start looking for a customer. He, he started by basically talking to customers. What, what is it that you need? You know, there's new opportunities to kind of provide these uh, end-to-end solutions for federal government, knew something about that, and was able to go ahead and compete and win on contracts and just build on that success. So I think kind of that starting with that federal space was a great way and very different than the story of kind of, Great idea, lots of capital expenditures, and then kind of thinking about a distribution strategy after that. And then the pivot points along the way, I mean, just as impressive as any kind of commercial product that you might expect. Ability to go ahead and and use capital to go ahead and finance inorganic growth to kind of balance the portfolio to so it's not just federal but commercial business as well. Technology transfer from the commercial space to federal. Uh, I was having a, a fun time. Yeah, and I think that he, the fact that he, you know, that his story started with 9-11 and how he really was inspired by the interoperability issues, we probably take for granted now um, when we do have, you know, major, um, you know, major events like, you know, mass shooters and all the other, you know, bad things that happen when um, our governments need to be talking to each other. That was, you forget what a huge issue that was. And the fact that he said, look, I want to help. I know the technology is there. I think a lot of times you feel that. You see these things happy. Like, that's impossible in 2000, whether it's in 2001 or 2018, to say, how can we not do better? Uh, and so I really like that, that part of his story. And it seems like that's part of their initial DNA that still carries through today. Just as the technology changes and the sources of innovation change, they've been able to change with it. But they're still helping the federal government understand how to coordinate and be interoperable among all their different IT systems. The other thing that I took away that I think um, you would think about in talking to young entrepreneurs is that we often... I would say, say we guide people away from the federal government, but younger entrepreneurs now aren't typically attracted to selling into the federal government unless it's like something cybersecurity. That seems like that's usually often one of the first places they'll go. But the fact that he was talking about that, look, if you want to sell into the government, they're telling you exactly what they need. They're telling you what they paid the last time, when the contracts are going mm-hmm. up for bid. So for you know, a newer entrepreneur, a little more of the playbook is actually you know, there for you. So I thought that was, that was kind of enlightening yeah, for me. With, with a little caveat, right? He did mention with the protesting going on and ways to go ahead and basically extend contracts by protesting new awards that are given and stuff like that. So maybe... You know, Sonny, what he did in 2002 isn't exactly the same landscape as here in 2018. Right, right. And you have to end. There's also, um, you know, 
you it does favor larger companies and it's hard to be small but I'd say at least you know there's probably ways to kind of give it a give it a crack. I was going to say Sonny's got 2,500 employees now. Yeah. He's not small. <laughs> no, I meant for younger. Yes, oh, for, for younger. Yes, for, yes, for getting it. For no doubt about yeah. it. But what a great success story, Alana. Absolutely. Fun. He, I think that um, yeah, it'd be great to to have Sonny back at the Smith School also just to talk about leadership and you know his role as the CEO. So uh, that wraps up the episode. Uh, thank you for tuning in to another great episode of Bootstrapped, a Dingman Center podcast. You can follow me at Ilana Fine or the Dingman Center at umd underscore dingman Uh, and you can follow me at joseph p bailey thank you very much to all of our loyal listeners for listening and welcome to our season four oh i'm sorry season five (laughs) delighted to be back here i know i know it's been a lot of fun and uh for all of our listeners we encourage all of you to think about bootstrapping your next venture